Lord God, you are so good. And I'm, I'm almost overwhelmed today with worship to you and praise to you as I just sit back and hear the saints here, those that are following you, that are praising you, being able to hear that in my ears, God, it just brings so much joy to my heart. And God, that's because of what you have done for each and every one of us, and it's our response. And so, God, we just praise you. Lead this time. May it all bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's a phrase that a lot of you have probably heard or you've read on social media, and it's a phrase that I think is very common a lot of times, and it is, I'm praying for you. And you hear that, and sometimes maybe it feels like shallow words, because is that person really praying for you? But it's a wonderful phrase, it's a comforting phrase, and we even hear it in the secular world from people that we don't even know what they're praying to. I'm praying for you. This is the heart of Jesus in John 17. As he prays for himself, as he prays for his disciples, as he prays for the future church, for all of us, he's praying for us. It's one of the few times in scriptures that we see the heart of Jesus as he just pours it out to the Father, praying for us. You know, and it, a funny thing I'll just say, in, in Matthew 6, we get the Lord's Prayer, right? And he taught us how to pray in that. And one of those phrases is, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And the interesting thing about that is that's a prayer that Jesus could never pray. It's a prayer that he could never pray personally because he was without sin and so he never had a trespass to pray for forgiveness for. That was a prayer that we need to pray on a regular basis to God. But in John 17, he gives us a glimpse of his heart as he prays to the Father. So I'll say this as we get into this, and I mentioned these just hopes for the series last week as we started. Like, my struggle with it is I want to have this be really practical, and I want to have a take home for you. And so do this, do this. And then you're going to have a great week, right? But I think so much of this is us fall, falling more in love with Jesus, falling more in love with the Father, being more committed to Him and His Son. And I think through that all, we're going to experience more hope for the church and the ministry He's called us to, and we're going to get into that later on. But in these verses, Jesus is... Showing his heart for God, hot heart for his disciples that have been walking with him closely and for the future church. So I'm going to read verses 1 through 5 again, and then we're going to get into verses 6 through 10. So John 17. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Some powerful words there. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they know you. The only true God 
and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And again, this is after the Last Supper. This is after communion that we are going to partake, partake in next week. This is after foot washing. This is after him sharing all these promises that he has for them. Promises that he is the good shepherd. Promises that they were even, even going to forsake him. They were going to deny him. but so many great promises that they would experience peace in a world that's full of tribulation. Jesus prays for himself, and in it, he wants to glorify God. And as we get to these next verses, he starts praying for his disciples. So he says this, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were and you gave them to me and I'm going to maybe bold a few words here. And they have kept your word. And as I say some of those words, I just want to say, man, there's some great affirmations here. There's some great words that any of us would want the Son of God, Jesus, to say about us. And he says this to the Father. He says, they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you've given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me and they have received them. And they have come to know In truth that I came from you, they have believed that you sent me. Isn't that the affirmations that we would love to have Jesus say about us? Wouldn't it be amazing to someone in the presence of God, speaking straight to the Father to just affirm those things about you? He's affirming that they know him, that they, know, they don't just know about God, but they know who God is. They know his character. They know God's attributes. They know his desire for the lost. They know that God's love for all people and not just the religious elite. And they don't just know this about God, he's praying, but they have received the truth and they have believed Wouldn't it be amazing to have the incarnate God say this about you? For Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, to say, this is my follower. He or she has kept your word. He knows you. He believes you. He has received your word. Wouldn't that be the most amazing affirmation to have right in front of the Father? So here's the deal. This is what Jesus says about every one of us. When we repent, when we turn away from our sin, when we turn away away from the way of the world, and confess him as Lord and believe that he died for our sins, that he defeated death and lives eternally. When we believe that, this is what Jesus does say about us. Jesus tells the Father that this man, this woman, this boy, this girl, this one is mine. I have bought him with a price, my perfect life and death on the cross once and for all. Jesus' righteousness is, big word, imputed. It's put on us while our sin is taken off of us and it's put on him and his completed work on the cross. This is 
incredible news. And this is what he is affirming in those that have followed him. There's a lot that have turned away. There's a lot that said this teaching is too hard and didn't continue to follow Jesus. But these 11 disciples have kept his word. They've received it. They've come to know. They have believed. It's an amazing truth, I think, for all of us to claim that it's the same thing, the same gift, the same invitation that we all get. And not only that, Jesus lives and continues the work of mediator. Verse 9 shows us a glimpse of what he continues to do. It says, I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And this is an important truth, I think, to understand. And I think our earthly minds have a hard time comprehending this. And I'll just maybe confess that this is something that I think for a long time I struggled with. It's like why, this is Steve talking years ago, why wouldn't Jesus rise again from the grave? And then why wouldn't he just set up his earthly kingdom right now? Why wouldn't he be just right in front of me right now so I can talk to him and he can talk to the Father and we can, I can continue to learn and grow just directly from him? And in my earthly mind, that makes a lot of sense, right? But God has a way bigger plan than that. And I could say, I understand, and we should understand as we know his truth that he has ascended to the Father and he's seated at the right hand and he's going to come again to judge the living and the dead. We can understand that. But in my mind, I want to say, what's he doing? Just twiddling his thumbs up there? And we hear phrases like, come Lord Jesus, like come right now. Because it's like, what are you doing right now? Okay, do you understand? This is not the right way to think. But this is how I think my mind and my earthly mind wants to think all the time. But God has a way bigger plan. So first of all, I want to say this, that Jesus' work was done. It's said it in some of those verses. He's completed what God called him to do. He lived a perfect life, told the world about the kingdom of God, how to live, how to love. He died once and all for sin. His work here on earth was done. And he's gone back to be glorified. He wants to glorify the Father, but he wants to be glorified as well. He wants to go back to the way things were before the creation of time in Genesis when he was there in the beginning. He's being given the honor and praise that he deserves for all that he has done. Next thing is that God sent the Holy Spirit to live inside us. And Jesus said that one greater was going to come, that the Holy Spirit would come to live inside of us. We get the mediator, the counselor. We get the Holy Spirit, the power of God to live inside of us when we have accepted Jesus as Lord. And sometimes in my earthly mind, I kind of negate or I just lower the work of the Holy Spirit in my life, in our life, right? And this is the part I want you to hear, and I think it's a, a forgotten part of, the, of his ascension back to the Father. It's that he's praying for us. He's not praying for those that have not accepted him as Lord. He's praying specifically for us. He is interceding for us. Yes, the Holy Spirit's inside us and it intercedes when we don't know how to pray, but Jesus is standing in the Holy of Holies and he allows us to have direct access to God. 1 John 2 points this out. It says, my little children, in verse 1, I'm writing these things 
to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. First Timothy 2, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man G Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father and continually mediating for us. Just because we have accepted Jesus as Lord, we still sin. And Jesus is there saying, no, he has believed in me. She, has follow, she is following me. She has accepted me as Lord. My sin on the cross has taken care of this once and for all. It is a beautiful picture of how Jesus continues to reign on high. How his kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. God's plan is so far greater than ours. Than our picture of what it is. And I want to say what it is not when we talk about Jesus mediating for us, advocating for us. What it is not is that just because you are a follower of Christ, just because you tithe, you don't just get fill in the blank. You don't just get good health. You don't just get a good job. You don't just get a new iPhone. You don't just get a shoot of big health. You don't just get a promotion. You don't just get to live perfectly here on earth. You don't get a perfect husband. You don't get a perfect wife. You don't just get all this. This is the prosperity gospel that gets sent out all over that people get tricked into and they send money to because they think they're going to receive these huge benefits. No, Jesus is giving us a far greater thing. He's allowing us direct access to the Father. He's allowing us to experience abundant life because we can be in right relationship despite our continued brokenness. This is great news. Hebrews 7 lays this out a little more. And it's comparing Jesus to the high priest. Comparing him to the great high priest, Melchizedek. And he says in verse 22, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. The problem with the high priest is that they died and there would have to be a new high priest. And not only that, they were sinful, so they had to take care of their own sins before they could daily lift up the prayers, lift up the sins, and get forgiveness for all the people. This was the old covenant. But now Jesus holds this priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Verse 25, consequently, he is able to save the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Isn't that just a great promise to hold on to? No matter your circumstance in life, Jesus is interceding for you. He is always living at the right hand of the Father and he is interceding for us saying, that is my son, that is my daughter. I paid the price for him or her. What a great God and what a great plan for salvation that we have. Verse 10 
of John 17 after he says he's praying for them and praying for us. He says, all mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. He's just told them in Matthew 26, 31 that they would fall away. He's told Peter that even though Peter as stubborn as as he is and as committed as he is, he's told Peter that he's still going to fall away three times before sunrise. But he says that he is glorified in them. And now Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father and he's saying these same things about us. He's saying, I'm glorified in you. You have believed in me. You have accepted my word. The world might go a lot of ways, but this is my son or daughter and I am glorified in him. I could jump ahead, but in verse 23 of John 17, he says, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. This is what he offers the entire world. And this is what we get to invite others into. A relationship to a God that had a perfect plan. Who loves us enough, which is perfectly. Who loves us to send his one and only son that whoever should believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. This is great news. And it's what we do get to invite others into each and every day. A saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me pray. Lord God, my words seem so inconsequential compared to what you do for us each and every day as you intercede for us. God, we should take great delight in knowing that you call us sons and daughters and knowing that you pray for us, you intercede for us, and that you are glorified in us. And God, we don't take that for granted. Thank you. Thank you for your work on the cross. thank you for your plan that is way better than our plan. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.